So at the timing worked, in lecture we were able to get through most of the Bicornaviridae family of viruses, the rhinoviruses, the enteroviruses that are spread fecal oral, and we're going to finish up with our last Bicornaviridae virus, which is a hepatovirus. And this particular hepatovirus is called the hepatitis A virus. Now anything that has that prefix hepat in it means it has some effect or causes some damage to the liver itself. And so the hepatitis A virus is our first out of five hepatitis viruses that all affect the liver, all can cause inflammation of the liver. Now the hepatitis A virus can be found on surf various surfaces. It can hang out and survive living on surfaces for days. It's resistant to cleaning. It's resistant to even bleach. It can be spread fecal oral as the enteroviruses, but it can be picked up just by touching contaminated surfaces. Now, the signs and symptoms for hepatitis A usually show up about a month after picking up the virus. It can include symptoms like a fever, fatigue, nausea, um, sometimes anorexia or weight loss, but one of the big clues that it's a type of hepatitis that's happening is jaundice because anything that has hepatitis just means inflammation of the liver. So this is a virus that can ultimately attack the liver, causing that jaundice, that bilirubin to circulate around in your body, causing that yellowish appearance. Now, this virus, as various viruses can cause hepatitis, generally doesn't have any chronic liver disease, and 99% of the time, people that contract this virus make a complete recovery. However, and I'm like, to avoid the virus altogether, we do have a vaccine. It is a two-dose vaccine. Now, I'm like, as I said, there are viruses altogether that can cause hepatitis. Hepatitis A is one of them. In our DNA viruses, we went over the hepatitis B, and this is our first of our RNA viruses that can cause hepatitis. And it has positive sense, single-stranded RNA as its genetic material. Now we're going to move on to still more naked, positive scent, single-stranded RNA with our next family, our Calisoviridae and our Astroviridae family. And these two families both cause gastroenteritis. These two families are going to both cause that diarrhea and vomiting. Now the Calisoviridae generally causes all of it. It causes the diarrhea, it causes the nausea, it causes the vomiting. And one particular group of viruses that fit into this family are the, are the noroviruses. And there's more than one norovirus. It does get the, get the nickname of the cruise ship virus because it does, it is spread fecal oral, but the problem is, and I'm like, and lots of people, tight quarters on a cruise ship, it can go airborne. And so just the flushing of the toilet, the vomiting can make this virus go airborne. And I'm like, when that is happening. And so they can get then inhaled. And so I'm like, it's very easily spread and causes lots of unpleasant side effects. Um, things that you don't want to experience while on a cruise ship. Astroviruses cause diarrhea without vomiting. Now I'm like, it does cause gastroenteritis. There's the diarrhea. They get their name because they look kind of like little stars. The biggest outbreaks generally occur anytime you do have lots of people in close quarters with each other. So yes, in cruise ships, but also in daycares. It can happen in hospitals. It can happen in various schools that you get big outbreaks of the virus. There's no good treatment. They're really, since you've got diarrhea and vomiting, um, it's just mostly replace fluids and electrolytes and get rest. Best is just to not get it in the first place. Adequate sewage treatment to make sure that is being properly handled as well as lots of good hygiene, good hand washing skills, lots of disinfecting of surfaces that might be contaminated. Now our last of our naked positive sense single-stranded RNA is the HEPA virus group and it's another hepatitis virus. It's hepatitis E. Now hepatitis E is an enteric hepatitis not because it is spread fecal oral but because it can cause vomiting as well as jaundice, um, fever, and fatigue. It's still a viral infection, but because it causes that vomiting, they, it's, it's, it's our one enteric hepatitis. Now, it might, and because of the vomiting, it, it did actually used to be classified as a uh, 
Calissa virus for a while. Now, in most healthy people, people that pick up the hepatitis E virus generally don't have any long-lasting effects. It goes away on its own. We just treat with fluids um, and rest. However, the unique thing about hepatitis E, pregnant women, um, it's actually fatal in about 20% 20 20 of all pregnant women. They think it's due to that increase in hormones triggers this virus to do more damage to the liver as well as damage our immune system. So it's kind of a unique virus that for some reason those pregnancy hormones triggers this particular virus to be more deadly. Otherwise normal people, even immunocompromised people, still don't usually have any long lasting effects. Now it can be spread fecal oral. Um, and it can be spread, it is a virus that can hang out on surfaces, maybe not a super long time, but it can still hang out on surfaces, so best prevention really is good sewage treatment and good hygiene, so you don't pick up the virus to begin with. It's not a super common virus, I don't generally see a lot of uh, cases, it doesn't make the news a lot, um, but it is a virus pregnant women can be concerned about, and we don't have a vaccine for this particular strain. Luckily, it's not a very common virus. Now we're gonna move on to the enveloped. So they all have an, uh, an, a membrane that they stole and it's still positive scent, single-stranded RNA. And we have the Togaviridae group and the Flavaviridae group as well as one other. Uh, but we're gonna start with the Togaviridae and the Flavaviridae group. Uh, we'll talk about the Coronaviridae in a little bit. But the Togaviridae and the Flavaviridae they're grouped partly because of their shape. They have an icosahedral capsid, uh, and a lot, not all, but a lot of the viruses in these two groups are called arboviruses, meaning they're spread by arthropods, they're spread by insects. The coronaviridae, the other one in this group, has a different shape. It has a helical shape to its capsid. If we looked at on it, if I was gonna look at the top of it, it would look like a big spiral and a mic. Like, so it's got a different shape to its capsid. And a lot of the ones in the coronaviridae are not spread by arthropods. So that's how they got their groups of our enveloped positive sense RNA viruses. So we're gonna look at first the arboviruses, so ones that are spread by some type of arthropod, whether it's a mosquito, a tick, a fly, lice, whatever it is, it's spread by some type of insect. And so it can be spread to humans, but it can also be spread to other animals, usually smaller animals that they feed on. Most of the viruses that are spread by these usually cause mild flu-like symptoms, usually three to seven days after you get bitten. So nothing too bad, you just feel tired, achy, and like you might have the flu. However, some of them can cause, not all, some of them can cause what are known as second stage infections. That it's not the first time you get the virus that causes the severe symptoms, it's the second time you get infected with the virus. That it can cause more severe infections. It can cause encephalitis, dengue fever, and yellow fever. And I'm like, that's, that's when it can be deadly is those second times you get infected. Now, this one, virus that's in this group of arboviruses is the West Nile virus, which we do have around here. It's in the Flavaviridae group. Used to be found in Africa, uh, but it was uh, in ticks and it was found on birds and some migratory birds that came over from Africa, brought ticks with them, and we now have this virus in the lower 48 states. So it's spread generally, uh, it can be spread by ticks. It can also be spread by mosquitoes, which we have lots of around here in the summer. Now, luckily, 80% of people that pick up this particular virus are asymptomatic. You would have no any idea you even picked up that virus. About 20% get kind of flu-like symptoms. They have a fever, headache, achy, tired. Less than 1% can develop a deadly encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. And I'm like, so it is around here. There are cases of West Nile virus every year here in La Crosse County. Few of them lead to deaths. And I'm like, but there are cases where some people are hospitalized because of this virus. Now, since it was originally found in birds, it does seem to be found more in birds than in humans. And it is a reason why if you ever hear in the news that, oh, there was 
a bunch of dead birds somewhere and they're concerned about that mostly if they see a bunch of dead birds and I'm like they will test them to see if they died from this particular virus it is a virus that can kill the birds as well and so every summer if there are dead birds that look like they literally just fell out of the sky uh, they will test them around here for the virus another random animal that seems to pick up this virus quite often are horses and so it's kind of birds and horses seem to be the two big carriers of the virus uh, around here. Now, when I talked about those second stage infections, one particular virus causes something known as dengue fever. Dengue fever itself isn't that bad. It gives a slight fever and then you're fine, but that's only with the initial infection. So if this is one of your white blood cells and this is the virus going in, the first time that you're exposed to this virus, you're going to have a slight fever, but your immune system is going to recognize it. It's going to develop antibodies against it, and you recover just fine. However, the second time that you pick up this virus, and I'm like, those antibodies recognize the virus, which is what they're supposed to do. However, when the white blood cells eat up those antibodies that are attached to the virus, it activates memory cells, all things that it's supposed to do. However, those activated memory T cells are going to uh, make inflammatory cytokines be produced. Now, inflammatory cytokines, these are chemicals that cause inflammation and they cause the movement of white blood cells to infections. But it's this inflammation. Your immune system is starting to create too much inflammation. It cr creates too much inflammation to the point that it can cause hemorrhagic fever. So an extreme fever, including bleeding on the brain, it can cause shock, it can cause hemorrhaging, and it's deadly anywhere between 10 and 50% of all cases. That big range really is what kind of healthcare um, can be provided. And it's really because you die because your immune system is overly excited about seeing the virus again. I'm um, like, the first time you see it and you didn't develop antibodies, just fine with a slight fever. But it's those memory T cells, even though they're doing their job, sometimes they do their job too well that it actually creates what's known as a hyperimmune response. And that's when it becomes deadly. Now, right now we don't have any treatments for dengue hemorrhagic fever for this particular virus. We've got a couple experimental vaccines they're working on. Um, mostly it's just treating, trying to keep fever down and hope your immune system and your body can handle uh, that hyperimmune response. Now, this is showing a couple examples of some of the virus that are in the Togaviridae and Flavaviridae. Ignore these for now. In the Togaviridae and in the Flavaviridae. And so there's your West Nile virus. And I'm like, I need to update this because this, I think, is finally in your new textbook. The Zika virus, which is in the Flavaviridae group because it didn't used to be on this map. Uh, but the one particular virus, even though we're not there yet, uh, that seems to stand out is the lacrosse encephalitis. And yes, the lacrosse encephalitis is a virus. It's not in the Togaviridae or Flavaviridae group. It's one called a Bunyaviridae group, which we'll get to in lecture. But it is the virus that was here, discovered here in lacrosse first. And because it was discovered here first in lacrosse, Wisconsin, it's named the lacrosse encephalitis. However, it's found in other places in North America. It's not found only in lacrosse, but we're named after it. We're in the textbooks. Yay! Now, this is just showing some diseases that are caused by various types of arbor viruses, whether it's West Nile virus, whether it's lacrosse encephalitis, that yes, we generally have cases every single year. Um, this is, you know, of these particular viruses. Yay, yay us. So we do have the most cases. And I'm like, unless you go farther south, they seem to have a lot of cases down in Tennessee. Um, but we've got lots of cases around here, things that are spread usually by, usually by mosquitoes. Now, the Zika, vir the Zika virus, which is in that Togaviridae group, and I'm like, or the, sorry, the Flavaviridae group, and I'm like, it's transmitted by a mosquito. Now, again, most adults are just fine with the virus. However, this is a virus that affects fetuses. 
and how it affects the fetus. It causes abnormalities, usually brain abnormalities, where it causes uh, the skull to be deformed. It causes brain tissue not to develop properly. In about 6% of cases of pregnant women that picked up this virus. For others, again, generally asymptomatic or mild flu-like symptoms, nothing too bad. It's just a virus that pregnant women have to be concerned about. Luckily for us, this particular mosquito that is that carries the Zika virus can't survive winters. Yay! So we don't have this particular virus around here. However, if you travel somewhere where they don't have freezing temperatures at winter, this is a virus to be concerned about. Now, this is just a show where we have had quite a few cases, and this virus didn't really make the news until uh, Brazil. And I'm like, that was because that's where the Olympics were, and they were having a big outbreak of the Zika virus. And so lots of people were concerned about traveling to Brazil while they were having an outbreak. And I'm like, and picking up the virus, and then later becoming pregnant, that yes, even later, if that virus is in the body, um, it could cause abnormalities of the fetus. Now, when we're testing for the different arboviruses, they're usually going to do an ELISA serological test to test which virus you actually have, but we don't have a lot of treatments. Most of it is just supportive care, some acetaminophen, try to keep the fever down, lots of plenty of rest. Um, your best prevention, since it's spread by insects, is don't get bitten by the different insects. So I'm like, use the mosquito spray with the DEET, keeping covered up, wearing light colored clothing, don't be in outside um, at dusk when mosquitoes are the most active, all of those different things. We do have a few vaccines uh, for some of the arboviruses. We do have a yellow fever virus, or vaccine. So we do have a few vaccines for, so if you know you're traveling somewhere, into the jungle, into the tropics where they don't have those freezing temperatures. You know, you can always check to see what viruses are predominant in those areas and see if there's any vaccines for those. Now we're going to get away from the arboviruses. This particular virus, rubella, is a virus in the Togaviridae group. It's just not spread by insects. So most viruses in the Togaviridae group are spread by insects, but not all, because here's one of the exceptions, is the rubella. It's more commonly known as German measles, sometimes known as the three-day measles, and the rubella virus is spread from the respiratory system, and so it is spread breathing it in, and then once you breathe it in, it spreads out to the body. One of the first symptoms that's going to show up is a rash of flat pink to red spots, usually about three days after infection. Children generally not as serious, however adults can develop a deadly encephalitis, they can develop arthritis. Um, pregnant women, if they pick it up, it can cause various types of congenital birth defects. It's been known to cause blindness, deafness, heart abnormalities, um, cognitive disabilities in infants from pregnant women that have had it. However, it is fully preventable with a vaccine. And so I'm like, if you're not vaccinated and you're a woman and you get pregnant, and I'm like, although you will probably survive a rubella infection, your child is going to have long-lasting serious complications, most likely from it. Now, we of course did have, you know, we have a vaccine, and since we developed a vaccine in the 60s, the number of cases went way down. However, we are starting to trend back up because we do have anti-vaxxers out there that are no longer consistently vaccinating. Now our next group, it's also in the Flaviviridae group. Um, most of them are spread by arthropods. This is a virus in the Flaviviridae group that's not spread by arthropods. And it's another one of the hepatitis virus. It's hepatitis C. And hepatitis C causes about 20% of all US cases. And it is spread usually by various types of bodily fluids. It's spread by sexual activity. It's spread by sharing needles. Though we also have cases that spread during organ transplants. And it usually has a chronic infection, which means this is an infection, a, you know, a inflammation of the liver that can last for years, even decades, that can ultimately cause severe liver damage and even liver failure in about 5% of the cases. Now, 
Luckily, we do have some treatments for hepatitis C. Unlike the other hepatitises, we have treatments for it. We have treatments, the, the drugs that are what are called protease inhibitors. This particular virus needs an enzyme called protease. Well, we have drugs then that inhibit, inhibit that enzyme, which means the virus can't reproduce, and it cures 90 plus percent of all patients, usually within about three to, uh, usually in about three to four months. And so I've been even seeing on the news, and I'm like, when you watch TV, that they, they are advertising a hepatitis C drug, that yes, it's very effective, it's just stopping the virus from reproducing. And at some point, your immune system will get rid of the remaining ones. We don't have a vaccine, though, for it. We just have a treatment for it. It's an effective treatment, but we're still developing a vaccine so that you just don't get it in the first place. And then our last, oh, I did have one more slide on hepatitis, um, or just one more picture, the hepatitis. It says no liver, no life, that yes, it can eventually damage your liver, causing liver failure. But we've got one more virus. It's the different shaped virus. It was in its own group. Um, it's still enveloped, still positive sense, single-stranded RNA, but it's the coronavirity group or the coronaviruses. Now they're named Corona, not for the beer, because Corona means crown, if you didn't know that. And uh, they apparently think that these little protein spikes on the outside of it look kind of like a crown on the outside. So it has a crown-like halo on the outside. Well, this virus is spread from droplets from the upper respiratory tract, generally anytime you sneeze. And the big thing that it causes are colds. Now, lots of things that can cause colds, but coronaviruses are the number two main cause of your common cold after rhinoviruses. However, a few coronaviruses are a little worse off than other coronaviruses. There is one strain of coronavirus that causes what's known as severe acute respiratory syndrome. We shortened it to SARS. It's an emerging disease because we're seeing more and more cases of it that it's gonna cause fever and body aches, but the biggest part about it, it causes respiratory distress, that your lungs cannot physically get enough oxygen across, enough gas exchange to take place to sustain life. And it kills about 10% of those that pick up this particular virus because of that respiratory distress. Now, we don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine, but we do have close to a vaccine. So they're working on a SARS vaccine right now. And I'm like, it's in trial, so we'll see. Maybe the next edition of the textbook will have a vaccine. Now, our next group, now Mike, are enveloped positive sense single-stranded RNA. However, unlike these, these are viruses that also contain an envelope or an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which means they can do reverse transcription. So they do transcription in reverse. So we group them into a family called retroviruses, because retro means backwards. And so they do transcription backwards. And there are two groups. There are oncogenic retroviruses, these are cancer-causing viruses, and immunos immunosuppressive retroviruses. So we're first going to kind of talk about the oncogenic, uh, but, and I'm like a little background on the retroviruses, they have positive sense single-stranded RNA, but they have two identical copies of it, and they can transcribe DNA from RNA which means they can make DNA from RNA because they are doing transcription in reverse. And so instead of transcribing DNA into RNA, they transcribe DNA from RNA. So one group is oncogenic causing cancer, one is immunosuppressive. This is showing the enzyme doing that reverse transcription, that we're gonna take the single strand of RNA and I'm like, and the red, and this particular enzyme called reverse transcriptase is going to first copy one strand of it, but it's DNA. So it's going to bring in A's, T's, C's, and G's instead of AU's, C's, and G's. And then it's going to get rid of that original single-stranded RNA. We don't need it anymore. Once you have that first strand of DNA, all your A's, T's, C's, and G's, which is the negative strand, and I'm like, we're going to use that as a template and make the other strand, the positive strand, and you end up with double-stranded DNA, 
from a single-stranded RNA. Now the oncogenic retroviruses all cause some type of cancer. It's where they get their name from. And the first virus in this group is called human T lymphotrophic virus 1. That it does affect your T lymphocytes. It causes a cancer called adult acute T cell lymphocytic leukemia. Now anything leukemia is an abnormality of your white blood cells. That's where the leuk comes from. Eme is blood and ia just means a condition. It's a condition of your white blood cells. These this particular virus causes your white blood cells to grow and divide and it's uncontrolled growth and division. Now most people are like, well that should be good, you've got more white blood cells. Problem is they grow and divide so quickly and nothing's there to check themselves that as they grow and divide they are making non-working white blood cells. They don't make the correct white blood cells. They are reproducing so quickly there are errors in the white blood cells. And so these are cancerous white blood cells. They don't stop reproducing and they don't do any good. It's to the point you almost start to get too many white blood cells. And too many of anything is a bad thing that when you have these excess numbers of white blood cells getting made, you're gonna end up having bleeding, internal bleeding in bone marrow, internal bleeding in your body. Now the other retrovirus, oncogenic retrovirus is your human T lymphotrophic virus 2. It also causes damage to your white blood cells and it causes something known as hairy cell leukemia. It just means as those white blood cells reproduce incorrectly, they start to kind of get this kind of furry look to it, which they shouldn't. And they're just extensions that are sticking off. And it can affect the heart, it can affect your bone marrow. These are non-working white blood cells. Now these blood are these viruses are spread generally through some type of body secretion so it's spread by contaminated needles it's spread by sexual intercourse it's spread by blood transfusions it's even been known to be spread through breast milk treatment we don't have any treatment for our oncogenic retroviruses we can do various types of chemotherapy but unfortunately that's not getting rid of the viruses and so usually the prognosis is poor. Long term, it's poor. It's almost impossible to get rid of the virus as well as get rid of these cancerous cells. So your best bet is to not get it in the first place. Monogamous sex, no needle sharing, um, testing blood before any kind of transfusions. And I'm like, anything just to not pick up the virus. Luckily, there's not a lot of cases of these viruses, but they are out there. The second group of our retroviruses are the immunosuppressive retroviruses. Now what they eventually cause is a condition known as AIDS. So AIDS is not a virus, it's a condition in the body. It just means you have an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. You have acquired the lack of an immune system is what it stands for. Now things that mean you have now acquired an immunodeficiency syndrome is you are picking up opportunistic or rare infections that healthy people, healthy immune systems don't get, you're generally going to have antibodies against the virus that causes AIDS, and your CD4 white blood cell count, your helper T cells white blood cell count is below 200 cells per microliter, which means it's not enough to recognize and stimulate your immune system to fight things off. Now, the virus, and I'm like HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, uh, re replicates only in humans and its job is to destroy ultimately the immune system. Now the origin of the virus, because it didn't always used to be found in humans, and I'm like is we believe the origin is the simian immunodeficiency virus, a different strain of HIV because this particular one affects us monkeys. Anything simian is monkeys. And this particular virus changed just enough that it now affects humans. And so now we have our human immunodeficiency virus. And its job is to destroy the human immune system. And there are two major types of HIV. There's HIV-1 and HIV-2. Now, both do the exact same thing. They're gonna destroy the immune system. It's just 
each strain is found in different parts of the world. HIV-1 is found more here in the United States and in Europe, whereas the strain of HIV-2 is found more in Africa or West Africa. Now, and I'm like, I'm not going to go through all of the HIV on this video because we're going to talk more about it in lecture, but I want to point out a little bit about the structure of HIV, that it does have two strands of that positive sense, single-stranded RNA. It's got a capsid around it. It's enveloped, but on the outside of it, it has two important glycoproteins. That's what the GP stands for. It has GP120 and GP41. These are the two proteins that allow the virus to recognize and get inside of our white blood cells. And not just any white blood cells, our CD4, our helper T cells. So it's these very specific proteins that allow them to attach and get inside. Um, I think we're going to pick up right here. And I'm like in lecture uh, next class. My only notes, I'm just going to kind of preview it, is just how the virus gets in, because then we're going to start watching the video in class. It attaches, it uses those GP120s to recognize and attach to the CD4 white blood cells. They, the whole thing, envelope and all, gets inside, but it doesn't need everything. It just needs the genetic information. So it gets rid of the envelope, it gets rid of the capsid, and you have your single-stranded RNA. That's where the RNA, or the reverse transcription takes over and starts to make DNA out in the cytoplasm of our cells. Once you have your double-stranded DNA, it's going to go where our DNA is inside the nucleus. It's going to become part of our cell's DNA. And then once, our, once viral DNA becomes part of our DNA, it's going to get transcribed, it's going to get translated, and it's going to start making more viruses our cells now have become hijacked. They now have the information on how to make viruses and our cells are going to do it. And so it's going to go through transcription. It's going to make more of that positive sense, single-stranded RNA, it's genetic material, and it's going to get translated and it's going to make all the capsid and everything else it needs. It then gets released, it gets all assembled, and it can go find another cell. Now when we watch the video, the big note about it at this point, it's not killing the cell. So I'm like, it's not killing these cells. Our cells, for a long period of time, just become virus-producing factories. It is something later on that's going to trigger it, that there's a slight change in the virus then when it becomes part of our cells, that then when our cells start to make lots of virus, the cells, our white blood cells, start to lyse. And that's where the big counts of white blood cells go down. So we're going to end right there.